Okay, thank you. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone at your session today at CBA 15. I'm Tasfia Tastim and I've prepared this uh, presentation along with my colleague uh, Hasib Mohammed Irfanullah. We both are from International Center for Climate Change and Development based in Bangladesh. Uh, uh, Actually, Bangladesh is a country based in uh, global south and, and we are climate vulnerable, but adaptation has always been a key priority in, um, uh, for, for us. And, and we have been looking for solutions from nature and ecosystem for over past um, many years. So in today's presentation, we would like to share stories from Bangladesh from uh, last uh, 20 years. Um, uh, and and, and um, on, on an intervention called Committee-Based Sustainable Fisheries Resource Management. Uh, so as you can see from the uh, map that Bangladesh is blessed with uh, lots of wetlands and diverse range of wetlands covering 50% of the total area of, of our country. And, and these wetlands are contributing to many economic activities such as fisheries and Bangladesh is ranked uh, third in, in open uh, water fisheries resources. However, these wetlands are, are losing connection due to siltation and, and, and there are conversion happening for, for like due to other development activities. So these are the two major physical problems that our wetlands are currently facing. Um, uh, across the country. Other than that, there are destructive fishing practices which lead to uh, over uh, consumption of, of fish, fishing resources uh, in an unsustainable manner. Uh, and in addition to that, local communities have uh, limited, uh, limited rights and restricted access to these resources and which make them uh, more vulnerable and, and poor. Uh, so, to, to address these societal and, and other environmental challenges uh, associated with the wetland issues in our country, Bangladesh has been practicing the solution called community-based sustainable fisheries management for over past 20 years. In this solution, we are bringing the, all the remote wetlands under one management practice, which enhances the connectivity of the wetlands. Uh, other than that, government is endorsing the, the, the permit and zoning modality to, to um, uh, allow the community to harvest the fish in a sustainable manner. And thus, within this uh, governance structure, uh, there is a bottom-up, uh, like government is ensuring bottom-up approach with CBA for, CBO uh, formation and capacity building of the communities, which is ensuring communities access to to, uh, uh, to these fishing resources from the wetlands. And with the uh, introduction of benefit sharing mechanism within this system, the communities and the uh, community-based organizations are receiving their portion of the benefits uh, out of this intervention. So as this um, approach is addressing the human uh, well-being in one hand and other hand, uh, the fishing resources benefits, uh, we are calling this intervention as a su uh, successful NBS. But let us look into the outcomes also uh, in detail that what are the benefits that we are uh, that we have achieved uh, or, or outcomes that we have achieved. So starting with the governance benefits, uh, there is multi-tier governance structure introduced while implementing in this intervention from the village level. So it is ensuring the bottom-up approach other than that, it is involving all the local, uh, uh, like local, regional, and national level stakeholders. So, so there is involvement of, of uh, all group of stakeholders, which is uh, which is managing, uh, like which is um, uh, transferring this intervention into a collaborative management system. And and this whole structure is supported by government policy and legal instruments. Uh, then coming to the social benefits, as Communities are integral part of this intervention. So there, the, there is happening like true capacity building and professional training um, um, uh, during this uh, project period. Uh, the, there, there has been leadership building and empowerment of the local communities. And uh, through this um, uh, uh, leadership and empowerment, uh, 
a sense of rights, uh, like uh, uh, ownership of rights and beliefs has been established, uh, established within the local communities so that they can uh, sustainably harvest the fishing uh, resources within from these wetlands and awareness and other motivational campaigns also uh, uh, generate a sense of belonging among the communities to conserve the wetland resources and, and to manage their social groups. Then coming to the economic and socioeconomic benefits, the permit and zoning based fishing modality has increased the in the fish production and this has allowed the other local communities to involve in the fishing uh, in a sustainable manner, which is generating uh, employment. Uh, then permit sales revenue also comes to the communities and CPOs uh, for this uh, for for many com community development activities, and this is providing local economic benefits. Other than that, the households are uh, like could uh, avail uh, uh, more uh, fish consumption, which is leading to the food security. Lastly, to, uh, but last but not, not the least, uh, 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 let's talk about the environmental benefits that we have received uh, with, uh, for this from this um, uh, intervention. Uh, limits on har uh, harmful fishing practices uh, and uh, uh, has been done through voluntary banning of, of uh, uh, fishing during the peak season, peak spawning season. And, and, and there's increase in the fish catch. And also the illegal, uh, 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 minimizing the illegal harvest resources has has benefited the aquatic life i think i have uh, one minute left so yes i'll go if this is my last last slide so now talking about the challenges uh though though this is a, a good and um, success case st stories but there are some still there are some uh, ined inadequacy in the policy stage uh, because the mainstreaming of the good practices in the national government plans and budget uh, allocation is still a challenging thing uh, here. Uh, but here in Bangladesh, we are graduating from the LDC to the lower middle income status. So there is a need to shift, uh, need a shift in mindset to, to not be more project or donor driven and there should be more uh, uh, um, allocation or, or mobilization of national financial resources. Secondly, as community is a, is a dynamic system, a dynamic setting, implementation of NBS and scaling up potential sometimes face challenge due to lack of, due, like due to local culture, norms, behavior practices, and local politics, because sometimes we cannot follow the exact technology when we work with the community. And my last point would be that, uh, uh, as we are always trying to see or the, seeing the result from the bot, uh, top down approach, we really need to un understand the social and environmental cost and benefits from community perspective to gather the evidence um, uh, to enhance the community resilience. So that's how I, I would stop my uh, presentation. And, and I would like to invite you all like, uh, if, you, if you ever would like to see this intervention, please come to Bangladesh. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tasfia. So now the next case study is presented by Florencia Zapata and myself from the Instituto de Montaña in Peru. Flor, you are muted. Thank you, sorry. Good morning, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> We are going to present a, a case of ecosystem-based adaptation in the Peruvian Andes and nature and cultural-based solution for food security. Uh, as many of you may know, Andean ecosystems are the result of the co-evolution of societies and their natural environment for more than thousands of years and centered cultures that have been developing outstanding technologies for the management of water, soils, and genetic resources. These technologies, both ancient and present, are expressions of complex systems of knowledge developed by Andean populations that are very specific solutions to sustain life in this territory of extreme climate and topography. Currently, the use of those technologies could be a great ally for helping mountain communities to adapt to climate change. However, many of them are being abandoned or underutilized due to various social and environmental changes, 
such as migration, glacial retreat, and climate variability. Uh, today, we want to share the case of the mountain ecosystem-based adaptation program that was implemented in six countries since 2013 by Instituto de Montaña, IUCN, and many uh, allies with the support of ICIFAN. In Peru, the project was implemented in Noria Scotia Landscape Reserve, which is located in the central Andes of Lima and Junín. Here you can see the different ecosystems that are present in the area. There, communities have been managing water and grasslands in order to develop intense agropastoral food system. Management of water was the key to the food system. However, there are traditional technologies that was used to distribute water uh, are facing many challenges. Uh, impacts of climate change, as, as such as glacial retreat and water scarcity are already affecting the area and will increase in the following decades. Moreover, in the Andes, the grassland and wental ecosystem on which, sorry, uh, on which the livelihoods of most uh, communities depend are uh, threatened not only by climate change, but also by other drivers of social and environmental changes. In, for example, here you can see the community of Miraflores that used to be dedicated mostly to agriculture. However, due to migration of young people that left the community looking for better education and work opportunities, and because of the change of agricultural market prices and income needs, local small farmers have been moving to livestock raising, which needs less labor force and has been and, and has better market price. But this also have unintended effects, such as degradation of grassland and wetlands, inadequate rotation of livestock, livestock because of poor water distribution, and weak social organization for the management of water and grasslands. However, here we also found uh, ancient water technologies, such as the one you can see here, the Inacancha dams, which are praying as them more than 800 years ago, that uh, uh, currently was not in use because of lack of labor force uh, for maintenance. This technology was used in the past for water storage and bioremediation system. Uh, through the ecosystem-based adaptation measure, we rehabilitated the ancient technology and expanded it using green gray infrastructure. Then new, a new available grazing area of 165 hectares uh, was catalyzing a process to improve uh, the management of more than 7,000 hectares and also improve uh, the social organization. This EBA measure was uh, designed through three components, green grain infrastructure, through restoration of ancestral and modern infrastructure, recovery of technology for expansion and conservation of wetlands, and for community management of native grasslands, strengthening local capacities and knowledge through intercultural dialogue between uh, university researchers and, and local experts about practices for grass and water management, and also institutional community organization strengthening, developing community grass and water management plans. And now my colleague, uh, Nicole, will continue. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Florencia. So we want to present uh, quickly one case study of community-led EBA, which is a truly endogenous design by the community intervention, where we observe four key conditions for self-organizing around the adoption of EBA. First is leadership. We have key leaders that provide vision and motivation. Uh, they act as knowledge holders and they link communities together, including through communications channels like the radio. We also saw that the value of water is significant, but water is valued as life and the community's economy is fully dependent on agriculture, as well as a community sharing common goals for attaining water security. We also found collective choice rules were in place, including creation of community bylaws, which were modified um, with participatory community democracy, which is really important uh, to secure such compliance. 
And uh, we also saw rules and sanctions being in place for participation in EVA activities. Finally, we evidenced norms and social capital, and these were key because social norms regulate behavior and they are, they are embedded in Andean culture, which holds strong values and traditions of respect, cooperation and unity, as well as beliefs about respecting nature. We also found social capital that includes trust, rule compliance, reciprocity and connectedness. And it's important to know that both social norms and formal rules play a key role on, in the adoption of EBA. Finally, we wanna share some key messages um, on the post-COVID recovery. So knowledge and intercultural dialogue is a key component. We know that dialogue between local knowledge and scientific knowledge has to take place, but it has to be moderated by a team that is prepared and trained in participatory methods. There's also a key aspect of local leadership and ownership, including uh, from all, all stages of the process, from the initial assessment to the evaluation, from the diagnostic and the design of the solution. Then we have uh, the need for them to be holistic and tailored design of the EBA, which means integrating nature-based solutions to local and regional processes and governance, as well as incorporating ancestral technologies that are being adapted to the current context. Finally, as a key um, content to resilience of, agro of agropastoral food systems, we know that water as a key element improves with EBA and this helps secure this type of food system. And in the context of a post-COVID recovery, it's key to know that the cost benefit analysis that have been demonstrated for EBA do show that they can contribute to improve local economies in this context. So with that, we end this presentation and we hand it over to our colleagues, Karen Potvin from IUCN from a case study in Ecuador. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for your interest in this session. So I'm going to present to you, let me just put my timer on. Okay, so I'm going to present uh, some experiences of ecosystem based adaptation based on an Iki project that was implemented some years ago in the coastal province of Manabi. Oh, sorry. So basically, this was um, a project um, which was implemented jointly with GISET and uh, with the Ministry of Environment of here in Ecuador and with the municipalities and the intervention sites. So firstly, I'm going to cover uh, some of the context. Uh, so basically, the, the project was implemented in two municipalities and the EBA measures in two parishes. So here we can see what Honorato Vasquez uh, looks like in a uh, Santa Ana municipality. And this is uh, mainly comprised by an evergreen pre-maintained forest. And in the case of the other uh, site, uh, we were working also in Membridal, in the municipality of Hipijapa. And this is mainly comprised by a dry forest, as you can see here. So besides the very rich uh, ecosystems and the natural heritage in, these, uh, in this province, and in these two specific sites as well. Manaví is one of the provinces in Ecuador that is characterized by, by a very rich culture, la cultura manavita. So here we can see some of the examples of this. For instance, the oral tradition of tale, uh, tale telling in Santa Ana, and also in the case of Hipijapa, uh, they have a lot of typical dances and they're famous for their toquilla uh, straw hats uh, from Hipijapa. So, uh, however, these ecosystems and the ecosystem services that they provide are actually under strong pressure, uh, mainly because of uh, land use change. Uh, we're going to see some of the examples here in this diagram and what are the pressure, pressures and what are the climatic hazards. So basically we have um, overall in these uh, landscapes uh, inadequate agricultural practices. We have uh, processes of deforestation and ecosystem degradation. We have also um, improvement areas for water management. We have within the farms inadequate uh, management of goats and other animals. Uh, and overall, a lack of a comprehensive farm and landscape planning, and also a dependency on a agriculture. And actually, this livelihood is what is being now um, affected by climate change impacts. With regards to climate change, now we're looking at um, a lot of variations within the rain and the, the drought uh, periods as well. So we have intense 
uh, more intense and shorter rainfall periods, and we have longer drought uh, periods as well. And with this, we have uh, different consequences, like for instance, processes of soil erosion. Uh, we have also landslides in the upper parts. We have flooding in the lower parts of the watershed as well. And overall, the climatic risk is the a loss of agricultural income, which is the main livelihood due to these extreme weather events related to drought and intense rainfall. So uh, now with our intervention strategy within this project, I would like to mention actually that this was a short project. Now we're gonna start a, a five year um, project. We will actually consolidate and scale up what we built um, a, between 2016 and 2018. But basically here, we're gonna see what was the intervention uh, strategy, right? So we worked um, on a process of building uh, several of the aspects that we saw from the previous slide and we built a package of EVA measures. So we worked on agrobiodiversity, in water sustainable management, in goat, sustainable, uh, goat and bamboo sustainable management, in ecotourism activities, in establishing also the first steps for uh, municip uh, a municipal conservation area. And overall, this package of uh, EVA measures uh, were focused on a comprehensive farm and landscape management to reduce vulnerability and also secure and strengthen the livelihoods. So we're going to see uh, with some photos what these uh, measures uh, look like and what have been some of the outcomes. Uh, within the process, we worked with a participatory um, approach. So we worked with field schools for farmers and uh, exchange visits and farm planning. Um, within agrobiodiversity, we also worked with uh, planting and management of forest and food species and productive systems in diversification, crop association, and seed conservation, um, in soil fertility and conservation practices, and also in associativity and how we can market better these products as well. Um, these are some of the photos of the goat and the bamboo, uh, bamboo sustainable management. Um, within food systems, we also worked in one of the sites with these uh, water harvest and optimal irrigation practices. So this was something very important, how we can actually um, harvest the water from the rain and use it for our own food systems. With the water um, uh, measure, we worked also with governance. So basically here, what the, the core aspect was working in, in governance, establishing some conservation agreements in some of the uh, water recharge areas, and also doing some improvements on reservoirs and catchment infrastructure. Finally, um, we have, well, we have three more components. So basically besides the EVA measures, we've worked on capacity building, uh, with different uh, target groups, teachers, leaders from the communities and technical staff from public institutions, universities, and also, um, and also um, a, a from NGOs from this uh, province as well. Uh, with the third component, we also uh, worked in including the EVA component and NBS overall uh, approaches within the municipal planning. And we also established the first steps in uh, creating a water fund as a technical and financial mechanism to actually uh, scale up these EVA practices within the watershed that actually covers nine municipalities. And finally, uh, with uh, the last component, which was communication, we also did a diagnosis and we actually used innovative strategies, for instance, um, uh, having soccer matches within the communities, bingo, cycling activities, photo galleries, all of this with uh, an approach of environmental awareness. And finally, we gather all of our experiences and lessons learned in our systematization. So to conclude, uh, some of the challenges and lessons learned, we have four. Firstly, um, increasing resilience of communities, and in this case, also the food systems and overall the livelihoods uh, through nature-based solutions depend greatly in social and cultural processes, which we have to reinforce. It, the meaning of this is not only the working on ecological process, but actually the core is working in social and cultural uh, dimension. Secondly, strengthening local governance allowed a culture of interinstitutional and community coordination. So this is a favorable environment that we actually uh, need to continue building on, and this is uh, a great environment for change. Um, thirdly, capacity building processes are successful by integrating local, scientific, multidisciplinary knowledge, um, 
actually uh, ICAB and the Mountain Institute and NBSI also mentioned these aspects of knowledge. So we have to promote this and replicate. And finally, EVA in planning instruments and public policies are key for sustainable uh, sustainability and uh, for scaling up these approaches. So we need to continue strengthening uh, our advocacy uh, strategies as well. So with that, I wanted to thank you. Sorry that I, I passed uh, one, one minute. And here's my contact. If you have any questions, um, I'm here to, to answer them. Uh, with this, I would like to also, um, I will also like to introduce to you uh, Maria Claudia Valdivia. She's from Practical Action. And we're gonna jump uh, again to see a case study in Peru. So go ahead, uh, Maria Claudia. Thank you so much, Karen. Let me just share my, my screen. Okay, you're seeing my screen now, right? Yes, Maria Claudia. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. Good day, everybody. I'm Maria Claudia Valdivia, the thematic leader in Green Fitness for Practical Action in Latin America. Today, I want to share our experience in growing coffee and resilience to climate change in the Peruvian Amazon. I want to share just a tiny fraction of what I have been able to see and most importantly to learn thanks to the coffee producers in the country northern area. They are the inspiration for me and Practical Action to continue working towards community-based adaptation technologies. They have shown me how this approach is not only useful, but necessary towards climate action. Uh, so let's begin. Coffee is a driver for development. It is a primary source of income for over 30% of the Peruvian Amazon population. The production of this crop is immensely led by small producers, which compose 85% of it. So when the pandemic hit and heavily disrupted this change, the impact was favorable them. Coffee farmer, families exposed to the virus, income loss, and food insecurity. But it wasn't like the future held no threat before COVID for the coffee farmers. Coffee farmer is severely affected by climate change. It, in the next 60 years, up to 40% of the coffee area of Northeastern Peru could not longer be suitable for this crop. Places like San Jose de Lourdes district where Neymita Parinango and Wilmer Gonzalez, who appear in this photo, uh, depend on coffee to make a living. Uh, the future of the farmers, the crop, and the consistency they depend on, they all rely on, ad on the adaptation actions we make to improve the livelihoods of, of the farmers and enhance the, re the regeneration of the lands. The communities working with practical action are changing the course and building a fertile future through ecosystem-based and community-based adaptation. Yeah. Okay. To harness biodiversity and ecosystem services, to reduce vulnerability and build community-centered resilience to climate change, practical action is firstly working with communities with agroecology as the foundation and diversification as the, as the adaptive response. We are working with multi-strata agroforestry and green businesses, which have shown they can contribute to tackle deforestation and depletion of biodiversity and soil fertility, improve nutrition quality and ensure food security. The diversification uh, I just mentioned includes, for example, banana, yuca, avocado, cocoa, guinea pig production, roasted coffee, and tourists, among other crops and activities to diversify the livelihood, something Karen also mentioned in, on her presentation. Uh, so far, we have worked in practical action with more than 1,200 coffee farmers, reducing recent vulnerabilities to climate change effects, and encouraged the emergence of a 50 women group leading coffee powder initiative and several new youth led ventures. Secondly, we work producing evidence with both the communities and the environment, interests at heart, to advocate for policies to the conservation of natural resources and employment in rural communities. Like for example, the forestry and wildlife law in which we took part, which promote agroforestry systems as the main technology for coffee production in Peru. This law enables farmers to keep producing coffee in the greater areas, but ensure the technologies they use are sustainable and the recovery of the soil. And thirdly, we work ensuring sustainability and replicability through knowledge sharing. Lead farmers and associations are demonstrating they can multiply the achieved outcomes. Uh, of the projects we have uh, implemented, and they disseminate their learning and scaling up the technologies in a farmer-to-farmer -farmer methodology. 
to this to this to these days we have worked with over 30 farmer leaders who are innovating and sharing within their communities one of the community members leading this initiative is Jen Kispe uh, and his family who is uh, the one on these photos uh, he plans three to restore the diverse areas around his farm uh, but he's also a very ingenious entrepreneur and produces honey, yogurt, a liquor made of coffee, another exciting product from his farm, sustainable intensification. Jen is a driver to change in, his, in this community, leading and sharing his knowledge and making it possible to replicate the, group, the good practices he developed. Okay. Well, uh, our goal is to contribute to community-led adaptation that strengthens local agricultural food systems and economies, making rural population and countries resilient for generations to come. To achieve it, we must overcome challenges with ingenuity and collaboration. At the community level, the challenge is to uptake this approach. We need to keep building adapt adaptive capacity within communities to scale what works and innovate and an innovate environment to adapt to climate change. At a national level, we must contribute to the synergy between government programs and initiatives related to agroforestry and green businesses. There is enabled policy framework for agroforestry and green businesses, but need to promote integrated system for device production that is both sustainable and profitable and in where nature-based solution enter in the place. At a global level, community-based adaptation is to be at the center of our ecosystem-based strategies. Climate policy, especially those linked to the NDCs, are recipes for success. Ecosystem-based adaptation is a proven strategy to maintain or restore natural capital at a community level to ensure global transformation. Still, it needs to be sustainable and maximize its impact, and it, and it needs funding that goes straight where it most needed, the communities and their path towards achieving these goals. So to successfully implement ecosystem-based strategies, they must be designed from a community-based approach, consider, considering the needs, context and culture of the communities, as we have seen in the cases before also, looking to strengthen what is already powerful and, see, and fixing what is not working. Agriculture is the main sustenance for communities. And if we want to, take, to talk about climate change, we need to broaden the conversation around agriculture and food systems. I want to thank the CBI organization for creating this page, a space in which we can connect and bring these stories to light and provide the struggle and achievement of farmers worldwide and find the answer and inspiration that translate in bigger change. Thank you so much. Well, here's my name and my contact in case you need to, to go broader into what we have developed and a specific project we have implemented in the field. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria Claudia. So now uh, we will head over to introduce the World Cafe dynamic. Let me share my screen. Okay, so up next, we will be breaking out into four different groups. This is the World Cafe Dynamic. We will have 30 minutes in total uh, for each group discussion. And we will randomly assign participants to these breakout groups. Uh, the discussions will center around two key questions, the ones that we presented earlier, based, and we will collect uh, and respond and reflect on these questions based on case studies per and per participants' experience. And the output of the session will be to present key messages in the plenary. Just a few rules on the breakout rooms. In a moment, you will be invited to one of these breakout rooms. You will have access to all the controls similar to the meeting and will be able to unmute your microphone. And we kindly, kindly ask you to also uh, turn in your video so that we can see and meet who's in the room. Um, please, if you need any help during this, this time, you can click on the ask for help button in the, in the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then you can confirm the, the request of assistance by inviting the host into the room. And the breakout rooms will end automatically after 30 minutes, but we will provide a five minute warning up ahead of time. And of course, you can leave, leave the breakout group at any time. So with these instructions, I will hand it over to our colleague Shugo, who will um, help us to divide into different breakout groups. And we will see you all in these rooms. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, now we're having the plenary session, where each group will present for about four minutes each to uh, share with everyone the discussions, the rich discussions that have been going on in your groups. 
And uh, we have uh, from each group, we will take turns. So perhaps we can go over to the first group and please read out the question that was um, discussed. The first question that's individual to your group before sharing the key points. And then please do read out the second question, even though we all know it because we've all answered the second question. And from then uh, we will head over to the takeaway messages. So over to the first group who was in charge of the first uh, question. Uh, there we go. Okay. Um. Yeah. I don't know who's presenting. Can you go to the first question, please? Okay, yeah. So um, I'm going to read the first question. What are key success factors for community-led design, planning, implementation, and MEL of uh, nature-based solutions for resilient food systems? So first we consider um, in, um, understanding the systems and build strong linkage between actors, you know, uh, agriculture, water, energy, all of those resources, uh, understanding the diversity of communities. Uh, they are not uh, homogeneous and consider this for the design and implementation process uh, because these uh, communities are different and are built are different. Uh, they have different interests, needs, resources, and all of that you need to consider um, when, when designing or, or planning an NBS. Uh, they need to have a bottom-up approach, um, need a strong community-led involvement at the grassroots level, um, you know, to involve the community from the very beginning of the planification, it would also make the implementation of the project easier, and um, it will also help to the sustainability of the project. Uh, robust monitoring, evalu evaluation, and learning systems through the implementation to ensure measuring uh, the benefits and uh, that the communities are getting the benefits. And uh, finally, sustainability to ensure, ensure a long-term process with access to funding from local governments and other institutions or organizations. So we have those five uh, key points. Um, I don't know if the team wants to add something a little bit, something, something else, or should we just move on to the next? Okay, so um, yeah, our next question, uh, what, what are critical aspects and or ideas of food, resi food system resilience uh, to climate change? Um, first, not think about it as, as, as silos, but the, uh, as we said, the interlinkage in the socio ecosystems and across sectors that is needed diversity of communities and context. Uh, interventions are not uh, one fit, uh, one fit fits all recipe. As we said, these are different communities with different uh, um, interests and resources and complementarity of local and scientific knowledge. These uh, traditional and local knowledge all have this um, approach, you know, that nature needs to be preserved and that we all need to benefit from uh, the service of nature. So um, complementarily of local and scientific knowledge and um, well, we all have this local and traditional uh, knowledge. So those were the three key uh, points we have from these questions. Uh, again, I don't know if the team wants to add one more or if we missed one. No, I think it was, uh, this, these were the, the main uh, aspects discussed. Nothing else to add or someone else from the group? Maybe. Maybe I would like to um, add a final question. We didn't have time to answer that resilience looks different after COVID. So we should start thinking what does resilience looks like in this. Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, well, that's from, from our group, Nicole. In, in our uh, group, uh, Maria 
and Amber offered to, to present the, the messages. Uh, I think that I, Nicole is going to. Yes, to next slide. Next slide. Slide, please. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, well, we're displaying um, a past version, I think, but um, hopefully there's enough information that has still to be edited and made concise, but I'm sure Maria and Amber um, can put forward a few of the key ideas that at least make sense to them. So over to you. Uh, thank you very much. If I can uh, start to get the ball rolling. Uh, what was coming out very as being critical is to ensure that um, even if we have communities uh, like local so civil societies who are leading, we should ensure that we involve the communities. Because at times, just because a local NGO is leading doesn't mean that they are involving the community and that they are acknowledging um, the local indigenous knowledge systems and they are actually taking them into consideration in their, in their approaches. And uh, that was also very key that right from the beginning, there's also need to acknowledge the critical role which these um, eco-based uh, adaptation and local knowledge systems play in terms of uh, facilitating resilient uh, food systems. And an example was given for Zimbabwe where um, most of the local um, indigenous uh, biodiversities and knowledge systems are going because they are not being documented since um, culturally these knowledge systems are passed on from generation to generation in an oral uh, kind of tradition. So there's also need for us to, to bring in a mapping of the systems and also to try and identify which are key for which particular area. And then there's also the need for uh, an important need for scientific proof. So therefore the scientists also need to be aligned in terms of how can they support and bring in even better clarity and also validate uh, these uh, traditional local um, systems and also validate uh, the impact of the eco-based adaptation systems. So that is also, um, it is also critical that the communities are empowered to recognize the value of their knowledge and also how important that experience which they possess is in terms of uh, ensuring resilient food systems. So it is key that there is an integration of the knowledge systems. Even if it is time consuming, there's also need uh, for us to invest more time in the first phase of understanding these local perspectives and also the local needs and also use participatory processes when we are doing that. So it's important that um, more than eight months are needed, at least for us to understand so that there's a participatory assessment which is taking place. So most of uh, the development partners and other key players in the sectors, they also lack uh, the humility or the time to listen to communities. They just bring top-down approaches and they don't take the time to really listen to what the communities have because within those communities, they also hold um, solutions which they've been using uh, for centuries and for decades as they adapt and evolve uh, with what is happening currently. So it's important that uh, the, there is humility in that and that these particular knowledge systems and cultural heritage identities are not lost uh, within the, the, the new era which we are living in. So community-based uh, if efforts also need to be enhanced so that we listen more clearly and we also avoid the top-down approach. So I think uh, basically even at policy level, there's need for the policy to acknowledge the importance of these uh, nature-based solutions and also see how they can build on existing uh, community needs, resources and priorities and not on what they think is correct. 
uh, I'm not sure I'll hand over to <laughs> my colleague to add on if I've left anything. I think you've covered everything, Maria. Thank you very much. And I think that's everything from our group. Uh, maybe next slide, Amber, you can uh, help us. Absolutely. <laughs> I know, and we're running short on time, but the um, from the perspective of our, our group and taking into account everything that uh, Maria kindly um, included, some of the critical and um, aspects and ideas that we discussed of regarding food resilience um, or food system resilience rather to climate change. Um, we had a lot of great examples, including from Zimbabwe, um, including about conserving local knowledge that may be disappearing. And obviously you can read more details on this slide, um, but incorporating sort of ecosystem and degradation and biodiversity loss that traditional and local knowledge, um, that's where the like key solutions lay. And so providing sort of technical support and other sort of, you know, scientific knowledge um, to support and sort of provide technical backstopping is a critical component of sort of incorporating traditional and local knowledge into ecosystem-based adaptation and nature-based solution approaches, um, including, you know, marginalized perspectives from women and other sort of different communities. Um, so that can be a really critical component, especially in food systems where a lot of that traditional knowledge and local knowledge is held by women. Thank you, Amber. So over to the third group. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, we were so much involved in the discussion, we couldn't select a volunteer to present, but I'm requesting uh, Tashfia uh, to uh, present uh, uh, our discussion on the highlights and our colleagues, uh, the group members can, uh, can add if uh, Tashfia is, uh, misses something. Tashfia, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hasib. Uh, Shubhu, can you go to the next slide, please? So thank you. Uh, basically, uh, we were, as, as Dr. Hasib mentioned, we were so involved in the discussion that we could not uh, cover the uh, common question. So we basically uh, uh, like took a deep dive in the, in the governance aspect related question. So what we, uh, in our session, we started with talking about the communities that how um, lo genuine local participation is really important, not mere consultation to, to uh, for, for any effective nature-based solutions. And, and we talked about that how actual community-led solutions are, are sometimes are often missing uh, because, because donors are, are implementing project. We say that we, we take community perspectives or community participation, but, but, uh, uh, but I think this is something we, we need to take seriously and we can take this message from there. And also we discussed that how we need to truly value the local and traditional knowledge while designing the solutions, not just incorporating it, but rather than taking the solutions uh, from the ground. And, and we also discussed that uh, when, when local organizations or local governments are basically involved with the communities while implementing any solutions that we are doing in many projects, but sometimes there are shortage of capacity within those local organizations. So that is something we need to take into consideration. Uh, also, what we have discussed in our group on the knowledge perspective that, okay, we go to the ground, we take the knowledge from the ground, and we always talk about that incorporating those uh, knowledge in the national level planning. But sometimes we need to go to the other way around also that we do the research and we take those action, action or learnings in the ground to implement so that they can, uh, they can solve those problems or solve those challenges. Um, and yes, we have talked about, I think the fifth point is also on the communities, um, uh, like our colleagues from Friendship Practical Action has shared, shared very good examples on, on, on these um, actual community uh, and, and, and uh, uh, local involvement. We have talked around governance issues and it was very interesting is that we know that government support is very important to deliver the um, um, effective NBS, but Oftentimes, government support needs to become into form dif into different forms, and those forms are often like prioritization of of any any um, uh, issues or any agendas, uh, relevant policies, and and funding. 
and capacity of the government. And sometimes these are missing in, in the top down, sorry, in the top in the top approach. So while we also say that these are the needs in the ground, uh, those are not often uh, uh, be possible to implement or, or the government does not have the priority to implement all those solutions. So we have captured few other, more other information. Shubhu, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So, and, and interestingly, when we talk about NBS, we, we, the, you know that there are two solutions, uh, sorry, two aspects coming. One is human well-being, and one is um, uh, biodiversity benefits. So we should not always talk about environmental or biodiversity problems. We need to focus on the major societal or development related challenges. For example, health related challenges, poverty, poverty issues, because sometimes those are the things that the community actually need to, to empower, to, to have uh, proper empowerment. Uh, uh, and, and we also discussed about how it is important to measuring the economic, environmental and social uh, uh, impact uh, uh, when there is any intervention on the ground, because oftentimes we, we do uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation, but, but, but uh, uh, all these detailed aspects are sometimes missing and, and practical action has shared like, like some examples and work they're doing, uh, they doing here in, in this aspect. And lastly, we talked about, uh, like we touched upon the gender issue and in, while, while gender, we, we got two things. One on the challenge bit, uh, like though we are in, involving the communities in, in implementing the solution, uh, but but due to cultural and, and, and other beliefs, it is a challenge. And, and we uh, finally, we discussed that gender lens in implementing and monitoring is very important. Uh, I'll, I'll stop here because we could not cover the next one. If anyone has anything to add. Group members, if, please feel free to add if you have uh, something. Thank you. So if I interest of time, we might move on to the fourth group now, um, over to Chris or to the volunteer. I'd like to invite Janet uh, Edmund to come in, if we can go to the next slide so she can see it. Sure. Thank you guys very much for this great discussion. I think a lot of what we discussed in our group has been already captured in the conversation. Whoa. Um, our question you can see is how do nature-based solutions contribute to economic recovery? Um, and I think maybe one thing that hasn't necessarily been mentioned is really to have the evidence of the different types of nature-based solutions that work and have worked, um, and then to ground them very practically in the communities and the local context. Um, we did hear a lot already about the gender lens and being very important, uh, critical to look at that as well as youth, I think, which was very much brought out in the earlier presentations. Um, and then I think when you go on to the next question, we were looking at um, what are the critical aspects for food systems and ecosystem based adaptation. And we had some really good points about the need to diversify for crops and income in order to be able to um, meet local needs. Um, and then also supply chain and, and looking at those opportunities to, to tap into where the needs are um, to you know, adapt the products and services and, and then really look at supply chain logistics in terms of web-based opportunities. So if anyone else wants to add, please go ahead, but it was quite a quite a pleasure to be working in this group and to hear all of this great knowledge. Thanks. Thank um, you, Jen. Yeah, I think uh, what we were talking about a lot was context. Um, it, it's very difficult to make meaningful suggestions on responses, but but if you do work, strong work between communities and development agencies in a context, you can, you, it's a win-win. Nature-based solutions actually are a win-win because it's diverse. Um, it's working with the assets people have. Um, and COVID has brought markets closer, although there are some immediate impacts which uh, we people are really, really struggling with. So I think there is this gap with how you cope with the immediate livelihood needs 
and then maybe what can build back better using nature-based solutions in the medium to long term. But yeah, it was an interesting discussion and I think generally positive, but the big one takeaway is we need the evidence to get people to invest and support in this. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Janet. Those are excellent points. And now we're gonna hand it over to our colleague, Hannah Reed from IIED. She will share with us our key takeaway messages from today's session. Um, and then we will go over to take a group picture to end the meeting. Thanks, Nicole. Um, it's been a great session and I'm privileged to be able to provide some last minute reflections on some of the things that we've heard and also my experience in the field. I've worked in nature-based solutions for 20 years. So I want to tell you a little bit about a project that I led by um, IIED, IUCN and UNEP WCMC looking at whether nature-based solutions to climate change adaptation are effective. So that's the same as EBA, ecosystem-based adaptation. We looked at 13 case study sites and we found that ecosystem-based adaptation was effective. And one of the key lessons that we learned was that stakeholders, and we interviewed hundreds of stakeholders in all our case studies, stakeholders routinely and very clearly articulated that participatory processes and valuing indigenous and local knowledge was a major contributor to building adaptive capacity. This was a key component to project success. And I think we're hearing this from the case studies that we've heard today, really strongly articulating this. One thing I want to mention is what do we mean by participation? And some of you have raised this important point already. Participation is defined in different ways by different people. It ranges from self-mobilization, where people take initiatives independently of external institutions, then it goes down to interactive approaches where people participate in joint analysis. And it might include things like the farmer to farmer sharing and the field schools that we learned about in Ecuador and Peru earlier. And then it goes down to consultation where external professionals define the problem, define the solution, and maybe they get some local input. And then at the bottom end of the scale of participation is information giving or passive approaches, where people may or may not provide any inputs, and they're basically told what's going to happen to them. So what we mean by participation is really important. And I think we've seen a lot of the case studies say articulating great, strong participation. In my study, we also heard examples in China and Peru, different from the Peru examples you heard earlier, which were close to the self-mobilization end of the spectrum. So Activities were largely community led. So at the Andean um, Potato Park in Peru, Andean cultural values and identity built high levels of agrobiodiversity and resilient ecosystems. And in China's Stone Village, they had a thousand year old irrigation system, which lessened the impacts of climate change, particularly drought. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we had a study in Bangladesh, again, different from the one that you heard earlier, which was really community based. So the one in Bangladesh was a was a top down government program to conserve the Hilsha fish. And it was largely top down. Um, and it was interesting, but stakeholders that we interviewed at that case study, some of them said it would have really benefited and been stronger if there had been more community involvement and that communities were you know, largely passive recipients of the project and they could have been integrated more to make it more successful. So that's one question, what do we mean by participation? Um, the other thing we found from our broader study was just the huge range of indigenous knowledge and local knowledge that was used. There was knowledge relating to pond conservation, farming methods, soil and water conservation, forest protection. I mean, it just went on and on, it was brilliant. And I think the case studies that you've seen here really demonstrate that the breadth of local and indigenous knowledge that can be integrated into nature-based solutions to climate change adaptation planning. I was particularly struck by the, the, the water management technologies um, in Peru shared by Florencia. So we know that adopting participatory processes and valuing indigenous 
and local knowledge is really a core part of nature-based solutions to adaptation. But I want to leave you with one key challenge. The key challenge for me is how do we do this at scale? Community-led approaches are by their very nature local. What we need to do is somehow integrate them into activities that operate at the county, national or regional level because climate change is a, is a global problem. It's not just going to affect the local level. We need activities and responses at scale. And from my study, we had one great example from Kenya where the Adaptation Consortium and Kenya's Drought Management Authority integrated local ward, ward level climate change planning committees to ensure that pastoralism was sustainable in times of drought into county level climate change fund legislation, planning and management structures. So we need to find more ways to do this, to integrate these local responses into broader scale responses. And we saw that from the example that Tasvia shared up, shared on, on how collaborative management was embedded into wider government policy making and legal instruments. And also Maria Claudia, who described the law in Peru that was supporting community-based coffee production. So both very interesting to me. Um, if you want to learn more about the global study on EBA effectiveness that I've described, you can find that on the IID website. It's called, Is Ecosystem-Based Adaptation Effective? And I'd now like to just thank everybody for a fantastic session and pass back to Nicole for some closing comments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah, for those excellent um, comments that are just bringing all this discussed today, all the knowledge, all the experiences shared into one concrete message. And I'm sure we will continue to hear more from each other in the coming weeks, days. We're now um, colleagues who are put in, in touch together to see um, you know, just how big this global community on community-based adaptation really is. So to end our meeting, we have about two minutes. I'm gonna ask everyone to turn on their video camera so that we can take a, a group picture of everyone participating today. So I'll give it a few seconds. We have, I think, two, um, two big pages here. So I'll do my best to do a screenshot. Let's see, do we have a few more? Okay, last. I think you need several screenshots, won't you? You'll have to do a screenshot three or four times. So far we have two uh, pages filled. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and take the first one. So everyone please smile. Okay, next, next one. Smile again. Okay. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you so much for turning on your cameras for that. And now just, it's up to me to give some, um, farewell remarks. And let me just share this screen. So on behalf of all the organizing organizations today, uh, Practical Action, GIZ, ECAT, IUCN, Instituto de Montaña, and NBSI Nature Based Solutions Initiative from Oxford University, we want to thank you for participating today and being part of this excellent dialogue. Uh, as a few takeaway messages or next steps is that we will be sharing the notes from the workshop with all the participants. The video recording will be made available. And if you do have any email questions, sorry, any questions, please email them to the workshop moderators. Uh, we, some of us shared our emails during the case study presentations. So yeah, we're very eager to hear more from you. And thank you so much for your time today. With that, uh, just say goodbye and have a great rest of the week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank Bye. You. Take care.